The Qin Dynasty is arguably one of the most interesting periods of history, more so due to it having only lasted a grand total of 15 years. From the events that led to its rise and fall, and everything in between, it'd be impossible to argue that this period didn't have a massive impact on China. These are the top 10 unusual events that occurred in the Qin Dynasty. And if you think you have a story or fact that occurred, please leave a comment below. Number 10. The War of Unification While technically pre-Empire, the Qin Wars of Unification are sick and nobody can stop me from talking about them. Prior to their campaign, the relatively small state of Qin had evolved to gain a surprising degree of prominence, becoming one of the seven major states in power at the time. Now, This was due to the numerous battle centuries prior that I can't talk about this time, but I, I promise they were really cool, one of which was actually credited as basically being responsible for the unification of China, despite it having ha occurred like 40 years prior. Just look up the Battle of Shangping. It was wild. In any case, the War of Unification was a result of this, running from uh, 230 to 221 BC. It saw Ying Zheng declaring war on the states of Han, Zhao, Wei, Yan, and Qi, conquering them in just about that order. This led to a complete unification of China, an effort which only took barely a decade to complete. Number 9. The Dazhejian Uprising Skipping ahead a bit into the future, following the spoilers, death of Qin Shi Huang, there were a bunch of uprisings. Also known as the Chen Sheng and Wu Guang Rebellion, named after its respective leaders, the uprising began when two officers were ordered to lead their soldiers to defend Yu Yang. Halted by flooding, they realized that due to Qin laws, being late for their government job would result in their executions without respect for the excuse. So they did what anyone would do. Rile up the peasants? and go for a good old revolution. And better than getting slaughtered for missing a shift, right? Well, they thought so. And managed to get around 900 peasants to back their cause. How they did this isn't completely confirmed, but there are two stories about how they might have gone about the process, and both are really weird. See, one story goes that Chen Sheng and Wu Guang wrote the words King Chen Sheng on some silk, and then fed that silk to a fish. When the fish was was purchased and presumably cut open by soldiers, they saw the message and thought it was sick. Another story goes that they supposedly taught animals to say, Da Chu flourishes King Chen Shang, which likely would have had a similar effect on anyone who heard that from like a cow. So now, these might be slightly embellished, but they're also really funny, so come on. Either way, they got stopped by the chief, so it doesn't really matter. Number eight, getting owned zoned by a peasant. Now, we're getting outside of the actual reign of the Qin again, but uh, I don't care. The Qin dynasty post-death of Qin Shi Huang was an absolute mess. Leaders were desperately trying to consolidate power, body their opposition, and avoid getting bodied in the process. The effective orchestrators of the chaos, Li Si and Zhao Gao, who we will get to, had a massive falling out which resulted in Li Xi's execution. Zhao Gao was trying to run everything, deposing the old emperor in favor of a new one, who then got rid of Zhao Gao. But the new emperor, Ji Ying, was a moron, and so eventually a real revolt uh, broke out in uh, 209. The rebels of Chu, led by uh, Lieutenant uh, Liu Bang and leader Zhang Yu, managed to defeat Ji Ying in in 207 BC. Of course, in traditional period fashion, Liu Bang betrayed Zhang Yu and founded the Han Dynasty, despite being a peasant. I have been in car accidents that have had less whiplash than the last like two years of the Qin Dynasty. Oh, and uh, Liu Bang was like a peasant, by the way. A, a, a peasant who became the ruler of China. Number seven, the Terracotta Warriors. Okay, so you probably know a little bit about this one. In 1974, a a bunch of farmers in the Lin Tong County managed to dig up this exceptional find. Three pits containing statues of 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots with 520 horses, and 150 
cavalry horses. Construction on the tomb began during Qin Shi Huang's reign. He had a thing about dying, but uh, we'll get into that later. And the soldiers were originally painted, though due to the climate and about roughly two millennia of time, it uh, kind of faded. There have been arguments that some of the paint could have been sourced from Greece, although the idea that the Greeks and the Qin Dynasty ever made content is hotly contested, so I'm not getting into that. But it can't really be stated in words how massive this project was. Every soldier was armed. Every single one constructed by hand, and the tomb itself is about 98 square kilometers, or you know, 38 square miles for the Yanks in the audience. Easily one of the single most impressive pieces of architecture known to man, it's just yet another impressive reminder of the exact scale and scope of the Qin Dynasty. Number 6. The 12 Statues Alright, story time! So, when Qin Shi Huang defeated the six other states in his quest for dominance, he demanded that every single conquered state hand over all of their weapons to him. He then melted those weapons and reportedly had them cast into 12 massive metal statues and a couple of bells or something. Each were reported to weigh about a thousand don, or roughly 133,000 pounds. Now, where are these colossi now? Well, a few centuries after the fall of Qin, Emperor Dong Zhuo reportedly had about nine of them melted down to make coins. However, because the statues were made out of a hodgepodge of different metals, and more importantly because Dong Zhuo is a moron, uh, the coins didn't weigh the same, which resulted in the mass devaluing of all copper cash. I really want to do a video on Lu Bu and specifically how he offed Dong Zhuo. The guy, that guy was a creep. Anyways, uh, as for the other three statues, nobody really knows where they are, so maybe there's another discovery on a similar level to the Terracotta Warriors on the horizon. Number 5. Book Burning this is one of the more tragic stories, but it's got to be talked about. During Qin Shi Huang's rule, Chancellor Li Shi convinced the emperor that all records excluding the Qin needed to be burned. Not only that, but anyone possessing copies of the Shi Jing, the Shu Jin, and or any other writings from the hundred schools of philosophy had to turn their copies in for summary roasting or they'd get whacked. Not only that, but he suggested a mass state of censorship which was the actual censorship and not the kind that you uh, right-wing morons whine about happening in video games or whatever. Hmm? Basically anyone who referenced the books, talked about them in any way, or god forbid used them to criticize the government, were to be borked brutally and quickly. Qin Shi Huang thought this was a great idea and got to work erasing thousands of collections of poetry, history, and philosophy. He even went out of his way to execute 460 scholars whom he just happened to overhear complaining about his stupid new rules. I would weep about this loss for hours, but poet Zhang Ji's work titled Pits for Book Burning is far better for it than I. Quote, As the smoke from burning bamboo and silk clears, the empire is weakened. The Hangu Pass and the Yellow River guard the domain of Qin Shi Huang in vain. Pits of ash were not yet cold, disorder reigned east of the Zhao Mountains. As it turned out, Liu Bang and Zhang Yu could not read. Number 4. High Speed Cultural Revolution We've said it already, but it really can't be overstated that the speed in which Qin Shi Huang implemented new cultural rules and laws was absolutely incredible. Even the Meiji Restoration period that effectively brought Japan into what was considered the modern age for that time, it took about around 21 years. And that was a messy affair that could get an entire video by itself. But consider the relative population contained within China. Consider the size of China and the size of the Qin Empire. All of this territory was shaped by a period of about a decade and a half, to the point where it wouldn't be until 1912 that there would be a major upheaval to this system. Obviously, it saw improvisation, adaptation, and change over the years, but just as Qin Shi Huang was laying the foundation for a wall that he envisioned would span the entirety of China, I wonder if he knew that the system of government that he was implementing would last nearly as long. Of course, the means by which this was achieved involved massive cultural manipulation and fascistic ideals, not to mention the body count. Actually, no, let's mention that. 
Number three, the body count of Qin rule. Okay, now while the Qin dynasty was important, it should be noted that the results of such a tyrannical rule were bloody indeed. Between high taxes, wars of conquest, and the beginning of the construction of the Great Wall, historians estimate that around 20 million people passed during Qin rule. An absolutely staggering number given, again, its decade and a half duration. The construction of the wall alone was estimated to have contributed to around 1 million of those, and it wasn't finished until long after Qin fell. It's a sobering reminder to keep in mind that while acts of war are devastating, the management or mismanagement of those in power can be far more destructive. Number two, Qin Shi Huang's quest for immortality. So it uh, turns out it ain't great to be king. As his reign continued, Qin Shi Huang's paranoia increased, only emboldened as three consecutive attempts on his life were made. This paranoia turned to obsession with the elixir of life, a fabled drink which might imbue him with immortality. His quest led him on a search for the Peng Lai Mountain, where a thousand year old magician had supposedly invited him. Qin Shi Huang had also ordered an expedition to search for the elixir, but they uh, never returned, likely due to being afraid of the consequences for returning empty-handed. It's actually suspected that uh, some of them did escape to Japan and may have settled there, though accounts in this area are pretty weak. Anyways, in uh, 211, a meteor landed in Donjun, and some cheeky bugger inscribed the words, the first emperor will die and his lands will be divided. Since no Nobody took credit for the masterful prank, everyone in the area was executed, and the stone destroyed. Finally, Qin Shi Hong passed, potentially due to illness, but as many fun stories go, it's actually rumored that he was killed by a seditious physician with a false elixir containing mercury. Number 1. Li Shi's Return It's fortunate that the end of the Qin Empire is as interesting as its beginning. Qin Shi Hong is dead, and Li Shi and chief eunuch Zhao Gao have to somehow keep everything together. For starters, there was the job of getting the Emperor's body back, which they handled by hiding it in a caravan of dead fish. Seriously. But they had another problem. They just flat out didn't want the Emperor's choice of successor, Fu Su, to take the throne, as it'd probably mean that they'd lose their jobs. So betraying the newly passed Emperor, they tricked Fu Su into taking his own life by giving him a falsified document from his dad that just told him to do it. Zhao Gao then betrayed Li Shi, charging him with treason, and the conspirator was subjected to the five punishments. Mo, where the offender is tattooed on the face with ink. Yi, where the offender's nose is cut off. Yu, or Yue, where the offender's feet are cut off. Gong, where the offender's are removed, and finally Da Pi, which was carried out by chopping at the waist. It'd be easy to say that Li Si was half the man he aimed to be, but just please cut the joke here, that was really stupid. Thank you for watching. To see more content like this, please like and subscribe.